Hey guys, my name is Mike Perea and today I'm going to give you 21 quick tips that will help you improve your wildlife photography. Always be aware of what's behind your subject. Create separation by making sure the background isn't too busy or takes any kind of attention away from the subject. Darker backgrounds than the subject or colors from foliage or trees work really well. Make sure your crops don't trap the animals. If the animal is looking to the left, give some room in the direction that the animal is looking. If you don't, the animal is going to feel trapped or caged and it's going to feel very closed in and cramped. You definitely don't want to do that. When it comes to getting the animal to fill the frame, there's a hierarchy or the best way to do this. Step one is to get as close as you can without disturbing the animal. Of course, we're gonna touch on this tip later. Number two, buy the longest lens you can afford. Number three, then you add a teleconverter. Now, adding a teleconverter is gonna change your minimum aperture. So if you have a 600 millimeter f4 and you put a 2x teleconverter on, it's gonna be now a 1200 millimeter f8. After that, number four, if you're shooting with a full frame, you wanna put it in DX or crop mode. This is gonna give you an extra 1.4 or 1.5 times reach depending on your camera. But once again, this is also gonna change your minimum aperture. So if you have a 300 millimeter F4 lens and you're shooting with a full frame camera like a Nikon D850, you're gonna put it in DX mode. Now you're gonna have the equivalent of a 450 millimeter F5.6. And finally, the last and the least is gonna be cropping in post. Now you don't wanna be shooting down onto your subject. It overpowers them, it's unnatural, and it gives an unnatural feel to the image. Get down low and lay on the ground if you have to. Shooting up can also be a little bit of a benefit in some cases, like birds of prey or any predator. You, they're looking down at the camera. It gives them more of a powerful and imposing feel. You know, they look down or they hunt from a higher position than their prey, so this works well in an image. Understanding things like wind for birds is important in any animal for that case. And knowing that birds like to take off into the wind and getting yourself in position to then shoot from the front as they take off is extremely important. You don't want a bunch of photos of birds flying away from you. Not everything needs to be up close animal portraits. Storytelling is a key part of photography, so giving some context to the animal and their surroundings, it helps tell the story of how the animal fits into the landscape. Study the animal you want to photograph. Know their habitat, their habits, what they eat, what time of day they're active, and where they like to bed or to roost. Again, it's about storytelling. A bird just sitting around looking at you can make a nice image, but telling a story when it's doing something interesting can be even better. And knowing that a kingfisher likes to land on this certain branch or an osprey prefers a certain area to hunt can help you get into better position to capture those epic moments. We need to be able to get as close as ethically possible to capture the personalities and the characteristics of these animals. Most national parks here in the U.S. have a minimum distance that keeps you both safe and the animal safe. You want to get close enough, of course, to get a great photo, but you don't want to stress the animal out or to be one of those morons like this and get attacked. Seriously, never do this. And one way is not to move in a straight line towards the animal. Don't walk directly at it. They don't like that. This comes back to knowing your animal. Anticipate where they're gonna be, circle around, don't move and try to make too much eye contact. Even appear distracted, like you have no interest in them whatsoever. Getting up early, getting your location, being ready is extremely important. And this goes hand in hand with our next tip. Getting to your location early and being in position so that when the sun rises, you're there photographing the best light possible when the sun is low. And that goes for sunrise or sunset. Now, I like having the sun at my back, lighting up the subject, but I've also taken photos that I really, really like when the animal's being backlit as well. There isn't a wrong answer here on which one is better, but just understanding the different types of light and how they light the subject is something you should always be aware of. 
Before you book that trip to Africa or Antarctica, go to your local riparian reserve or your local parks and practice. Practice, practice, practice. This is where you need to be learning about focus modes and metering and shutter speeds and just how your camera works. Now there isn't one focus mode or focus area that works in every situation. Also shutter speed for flying birds varies as well. For example, I find that large flying birds like herons and egrets works around 1 800th of a second to maybe 1 1000th of a second. While birds like ducks or diving birds, anything that flies really fast are around 1 2500th of a second or faster faster. But you really got to go to the local parks, re riparian reserves, and just practice this. You want to experiment before you're going to go book these expensive trips to exotic locations. It's so important. Now give some added depth to your image by placing some tall grass or branches in the foreground or having foliage frame the animal. It just gives you a more three-dimensional aspect to your image. This goes back to knowing about the animal you plan to photograph. Don't go to Iceland in September to look for puffins. They're gonna be already out at sea by now. Go in July. Or the elk rut in Arizona is around the middle of September, so that's the best time to catch the bulls fighting each other over the cows. When looking for animals, don't forget to look down. Look for signs for the animals, whether that's tracks or droppings. My wife and I were doing a hike last week and she saw some bird poop on a rock. Now, I just happened to look up at the tree above us and right there was a long-eared owl. It was just sitting there watching us. Now, had she not seen that poop on the ground, I would have completely missed it and walked right by. Safety for both you and the wildlife. Understand the animal's body language. Animals have a way of letting you know that they don't like you around. Some animals, they lower their head or their ears, they stomp or they're snorting, or I've seen bears even smacking their teeth. Those are all warning signs that they're not happy. Keep a safe distance and don't chase. Do your research, try to be where the animals are going, and don't follow them around, pushing them further and further away. Now there are some great apps to help you find birds in the area that you're in. eBird and Audubon are two that I use that I have. They show reported sightings. You can search by birds or regions or characteristics, and you can even hear the calls from the different species. Binoculars can help so much when trying to locate animals. You know, my wife and I, we use her binoculars all the time. Being able to watch the animals from a distance before you approach can be extremely helpful. Park rangers are the experts. They know where the animals are, where they've been, most recent sightings, the best places to find them, the conditions of the area, as well as so many details that you may not know, especially if you're new to an area or you've never been there before. We had this happen to us in Yellowstone. We were able to find out that one of the wolf packs just killed a bison in Lamar Valley right after it happened. Wildlife photography requires patience. It's one of the many challenges in this genre of photography. Scouting and waiting can be hard to do and sometimes it doesn't pay off. They're wild animals, but if you do your research, scout out the areas, come back over and over, you give yourself more chances for success than you will if you just show up for sunrise to a place you found on Google Maps and expect a portfolio image. Remember, this is an art. Get creative with your compositions, your technique, and your post-processing. This is a big one. Make it easy on yourself. First, know your camera from top to bottom. Most cameras have the ability to customize buttons and I suggest you use them. For my Nikon Z7 II, I have this ring set up on my 100 to 400 millimeter lens that I can adjust the exposure compensation with. Now I shoot a lot in manual mode with auto ISO and then I use this ring for exposure compensation. So if I'm photographing a white egret with a dark background and my camera's metering for exposing for that dark background, it may blow out the highlights in that white egret. So what I can do is I can quickly adjust exposure compensation to lower the exposure with this ring. I can also program my record button so that when I'm actually in photo mode, I can hold down the record button and turn the front dial and I can switch back and forth between different 
different focus areas. Remember, there isn't one focus mode or focus area that works in all situations. And being able to switch quickly without me bringing up the menu, searching for the right mode, saves me so much time and I'm less likely to miss the shot. Now, if you're interested in seeing some of my wildlife photography vlogs, I've created a playlist here. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.